drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, C-suite veteran Peter Traber, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on this week's edition of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease surfs up. Episode 14 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami starts now. For the last couple of weeks, I made a fuss about us being preteens and teenagers, but we're now officially old. We're on episode 14. The agent with my kids told me they knew more relative to me than they did at any other point in their lives. This is an unusual week for us. The entire lead surfing crew is here this week. Peter, say hi. Welcome back. Yeah. Hi, Roger. It's great to be here. Good to have you back with us. Okay. Thank you. Sunil, say hi. Hello, everyone. Luis. Hi, everyone. Steven, who needs no introduction. Hola. Gracias, amigo. All right. We're all here. So, and that's exciting. And we've got lots of interesting things to talk about. And we've had some interesting news over the past week. If you've been to the webpage or you've seen any of the promo, we started an advanced notice section. Depending upon which podcaster you follow, you may be getting our webcast as late as six to eight hours after it drops, sometimes even later. If we have your email address, we will send you a letter as soon as it drops and a link to the actual Surfing Nash page so that you can get to it as quickly as possible. People have said they lost a day. We've occasionally gotten a letter saying, gee, it's not up on my uh, server yet. What are you guys saying this week? This would make that problem go away. We're also starting to get ideas about patient segments. And I expect we'll be feeding you more information about patient-focused programming within the next week or two. If you have thoughts about patient-focused programming or questions in general, questions can go to questions at surfingnash.com. And with that said, let's get on to our podcast. This week, we're going to talk about professional highlights. Uh, Brave One, go first. Yeah, hi, this is Peter. This isn't necessarily a highlight, but it's an observation uh, that I've made over the last week. I have uh, two clients that are submitting INDs or have submitted INDs for COVID-19 specific trials. And I have a number of other clients that are submitting or have submitted INDs unrelated to COVID-19. And what I'm seeing is the FDA and the EMA getting pretty much inundated with COVID-19 related INDs. And they're going through and they're working very hard on them. And all the other uh, business that the agencies do is getting pushed back and postponed. So they're doing their best to keep up, but we're definitely seeing an effect in the industry of the very large number of COVID-19 projects that are going forward. Thanks, Peter. That's an interesting thing for everybody who's in planning or in trial development to note. So thanks for sharing that. This is Stephen. Professionally, I would say that despite the COVID resurgence in states like Florida and Texas, Arizona and California, which is predominantly where a lot of our summit network sites reside, we have continued to push through enrolling NASH clinical trials. And the statistics we just looked at this week show 50% of all clinical trials enrollment are coming through the Summit Network. So that's a nice milestone for us. And kudos to the sites that are taking part in that for pushing through despite the challenges that we see with COVID. They're real and we are dealing with them and doing so while maintaining excellent data integrity and ensuring the safety of our staff and patients at the same time. So it takes a lot of work but kudos to the team for making that happen. Okay, that's great. Louise, go ahead. Um, I think a positive for us was that we volunteered to scan some people who were put into isolation, who were taken off. They were rough sleepers, and they were taken into isolation and offered support, and they've engaged with services, and we're going to provide scanning facilities so that these people can all be scanned before they move on into different aspects of care, having engaged very heavily now with support services, getting clean, getting dry. And I think that's been an encouragement out of what has been a a disaster or could have been a disaster for them. But Mm -hmm. um, there's been a very positive um, take up on that. That's great. Sunil? 
as COVID has been taking hold and has been modulating throughout throughout uh, society. Originally just kept in touch with the high level epidemiology type aspects, but as of the last week or two with new data coming out, I'm really digging into understanding how this disease is impacting various other organ systems, how it's influenced by comorbidity. So I think there's a lot of good signs coming. We still have a lot to learn, but I think that's been kind of a revelation, at least in terms of the way that I've been thinking about the field. So is there any one particular uh, insight that you glean that you want to share that's kind of either overarching or really powerful in general? I think certainly there is a tight story between COVID and the liver. And I think we're still unpacking all the details of what that is, but certainly with ACE2 receptors being present on cholangia sites and just how people have been tested showing positivity in the upper respiratory tract in early stages of disease and then towards the end of disease, still having positive viral loads, but they're not in the chest anymore. They're actually in the GI system and they're they're detected through fecal matter. So I, I think that it's moving through the body. There's definitely something going on with the liver liver fat and other features seem to have a prognostic threshold or, or potential. So I think that just as an overarching, liver and COVID is not nonsense. Okay. And you're about five minutes ahead of where I would have wanted you to be in the podcast to be perfect, but that's great. And we'll set up nicely every place we're going. My personal best actually is about the podcast. We are constantly amazed to learn how many of you are listening that we don't know, haven't met, don't touch, but somehow you're out there. My favorite this week was a tweet that Louise actually picked up third or fourth hand from a hepatologist somewhere in the UK who saw the initial announcement from Stat Plus on Intercept and immediately tweeted out to his friends, can't wait to hear what the hep dynamics people have to say about this. My second favorite was the podcast I got, the link that I tweeted, I got at four in the morning when we dropped that episode a little bit late saying, I've been waiting to hear what you have to say. When's your uh, podcast? So, so if we're providing that kind of service for you folks, that's really exciting. We always like to hear good news. We like to hear that people are paying attention. So feel free to write us and share as best you can. My favorite comment from last week actually came from a friend of mine who I didn't know was listening. Uh, Dr. Mick Colossa, really a legendary guy, one of the leading pharmaceutical economists in the industry, one of the best tarpon fishers in the world, and a guy who in his 20s and then again in his 60s has been a chart-busting blues recording artist. Fascinating guy, good friend. Mississippi Mick, as the blues people know him, asked, and I quote, how far do these diagnostics take us down a path to where we can tailor therapies to specific patient needs and then make the process economic? Sound. I think that's a, a great question. Using non-invasive tests to tailor therapies to specific needs. We're just in the infancy of beginning to understand the pathogenesis of this disease. And there's still a lot more, to use Sunil's term, unpack than what we've already done. And there's lots of different biomarkers in development. There's wet or blood-based biomarkers that, that reflect inflammatory changes, that reflect metabolic changes that reflect fibrotic changes and trying to figure out which ones are upregulated or downregulated in an individual patient is one thing, but to try to figure out what that is in a whole population is another thing. And then reflecting on the context of use that we discussed last time, meaning is it a diagnostic, is it a measure of therapeutic efficacy, or is it a predictor of long-term outcome? I think really where I would angle on the question is how do we begin to use these non-invasive tests to predict long-term outcome in different populations of patients? That is definitely something I think we have the capability to do, but we just aren't refined enough with our current non-invasive tests to do that. I think it's a great question. You keep playing the blues and we'll keep looking for the answers. I'm sure he will do that because he's really good at it and has a lot of fun with it. Peter. The commercial folks in the room in thinking about NASH therapies are always going to be thinking about which non-invasive tests both diagnose the patients appropriately for the particular drug and one that correlates with significant changes. So I think that the large efforts that are underway to look at non-invasive markers, and in particular, those positive clinical trials that also utilize non-invasive markers are going to be really critical to the commercialization of these drugs. So we talked a lot a couple of weeks ago about the big endpoints based on liver biopsy or outcomes. But from a commercial standpoint, the critical issue for getting drugs into clinical practice is going to be 
what non-invasive tests we use to diagnose and to follow patients. Okay, thanks, Peter. Sunil, Louise, anything to add? I can just provide something that's pretty much in line with what's been discussed. I mean, I was at a payer ad board centered around a non-invasive technology a few years back, and I was sitting next to someone who actually was a former Hopkins alumnus as well. And we had a side conversation. Really, the same thing that Peter just said uh, came up again. And they were saying, ideally, we'd want to have something that was used to identify patients and at the same time is modulated with, you know, as they get better or get worse. Therefore, you know, not only can I use it to identify, but I could use it down the road to monitor and, you know, presumably have stopping conditions and things of that nature. So I think it's the totality of that story that's going to be really important. And I think we're all seeking it. It takes data and it takes time, but I think we have some promising things already in hand and looking to generate more data. Yeah, I think the more we can move to non-invasive technology and secure the quality of data that we want, the more that that advances patients who get access to treatments, to trials. And I think we I discussed last week around about um, multi-scan with the spectrum and fibre scan that you need a funnel type system to bring people down. So you need your non-invasive markers that are wet markers along with non-invasive scanning equipment. And hopefully one day we'll get to a position whereby we actually do not need to stick a needle in anybody's liver if we can avoid it, the more that this technology goes. And I think the more we can make it handheld, the more broad the areas that we can put these into, because there's some very difficult areas in the world with some very high prevalence rates. Agreeing firmly with all that, and I'm actually going to run around to the other part of the conversation last week, which was about AI. The more I read and the more I see, the more excited I get about the prospect for AI to simplify and streamline the entire process. Because if you can get precise and consistent readings, even with biopsies that we're doing right now, it enables us to do a much better job of, if we have better dependent variable, like I said last week, we do a much better job of predicting, which means we can figure out how these individual tests slot into different patient situations and needs and can move the whole process efficiently to getting folks to the right diagnosis a lot faster. I suspect in some ways AI will be transitional, that if we're able to do more with non-invasive testing and less with biopsy, that the biopsy portion of AI will matter less. But the ability to use machine learning to keep getting smarter about the differences between patients and patient types and what we need to have to test each, I think that's not going to go away. And I think that's really a fascinating adjunct to having better tests is the ability to analyze them so we make better use of them. Yeah, let me make one more just brief comment uh, on this area. A lot of times when people come and ask you about non-invasive testing, they're expecting some brand new miraculous thing to come dropping out of the sky and make a big difference. I think we probably already have the testing that is going to make the kind of difference that we're looking for in clinical diagnosis and monitoring patients. It really is going to take creative and clever ways of looking at the data and analyzing it and putting together algorithms. And I think you're exactly right that AI is going to be a huge help in that. Yes, there are some things on the horizon that are new and novel that may be helpful, but I think we probably already have it and have to focus on much of what we are already doing. Okay. Thank you, Peter. You've now gone full circle to where we started the first discussion with Professor Ranella uh, on Diagnostic Diagnostics 1 several weeks ago. I think it's a great point to step off since we're now right back at the beginning of the carousel ride. On to today's topic. Over the past couple of weeks, we've gotten a bunch of responses to some of what Brian Harvey talked about during episode 12, some positive, some negative. But one of the assertions that caught some attention was the statement he made that he felt that NASH might represent a failure of primary care medicine. I'm not sure I understand his point exactly, but I think what he was referring to is the idea that if we did a better job of treating obesity and diabetes, NASH would never come to the fore. Because if you treat obesity well enough, you can get people to lose enough weight. And if you couple that with diabetes, the metabolic issues issues become a lot less severe. Someone who sent a note choosing to remain anonymous because that person's job deals with regulators in the U.S. and didn't want to be identified by name wrote, and I quote, maybe so, but it's equally likely that identifying and determining how to treat NASH demonstrates success at peeling back the layers of easy to measure metabolic metrics to appreciate the structures that drive underlying disease. Peter and I were talking about all this on the phone last Friday And we kind of came to the conclusion, using one metaphor, that liver is a little bit like the Rodney Dangerfield of the body, the organ that gets no respect when it deserves it. We decided it would be interesting to do an episode that we loosely called Respect for the Liver that would talk about different ways that we don't appreciate enough the role of the liver in the disease processes that you need to diagnose and treat. 
mindful of that, Stephen, I recall, describes the liver frequently and publicly as being like the canary in the coal mine, which I've always taken to mean that liver disease, has, depending on where you're looking, has three different outcomes. And sometimes it applies to issues of viral response, sometimes cardiovascular, sometimes end-stage liver disease. So Stephen, do me a favor, amplify a little bit on the canary in the coal mine comment. The canary in the coal mine mentality as it relates to fatty liver is, I think, a very apropos statement. And it's one that I use with my patients almost every week. I guess if you don't know where that comes from, it's probably worthy of a brief introduction to that so you don't have to go look it up. Basically, my understanding of the canary in the coal mine originated in the setting of mining towns back in the day when mining shafts weren't ventilated well there was an opportunity or or a probability that one would pickaxe or somehow uncover a gas pocket that had carbon monoxide or some other noxious gas in it, and it would not have a smell, and that the next thing you know, these miners are all dying. And back in the day, they decided to take down a little bird with them in a cage, thus the canary, and they would prop the bird up in the cage on the side of where they're working, and ultimately, every now and then, check on the bird, and if the bird was good, they felt like they were good. If the bird was dead, they needed to get out. So it was a sensor of something bad happening. And I think it's very apropos because the liver is essentially that same organ type thing for the body. So such that for patients with fatty liver that have dysregulated metabolism, the way that the body handles excess energy is it converts it to fat and it stores it very readily in skeletal muscle and in the liver and to some extent even in cardiac tissue and the pancreas as well and maybe other organs that I'm not quoting right now. But since I'm a gastroenterologist, I used most of those. The cardiology piece is just something that's in the literature. But ultimately, identifying a patient having fatty liver, assuming that it's not due to alcohol, or it's not due to medications, or it's not due to some other lipodystrophy event, that you can link that to dysregulated energy metabolism. So the first thing that improves, believe it or not, when you begin to eat right, exercise, undergo lifestyle change, is the liver begins to clear itself of the excess fat. So it both is a predictor of what's likely to happen. We know that fatty liver predicts the onset of diabetes by about twofold. And then it also is a good marker of improving your overall health. We also know that fat and NASH are drivers of fibrosis. And you might ask, well, why is fibrosis always standing out as a predictor of bad outcome? It's because NASH is a collinear variant. It's sitting there in the same space as fibrosis. So it's always going to get drowned out when you do multivariate analysis. But it doesn't mean that NASH doesn't have a role to play here. So that's why I get the canary in the coal mine mentality. But ultimately, there's more to fatty liver than just liver outcomes, right? We've talked about this before. It's well known in the literature. Number one and number two killer of a fatty liver patient is not decompensated liver disease. It's number one, cardiovascular outcome. And number two, all-cause malignancy that's not hepatic related. So this would be colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. And This is pretty obvious. The presence of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes and obesity appear to select patients with NAFL who are at increased risk for both NASH and cardiovascular complications. It's hard to tease out the differences. And it's not uncommon to see these patients having increased incidences of renal insufficiency, which is known to further accelerate atherogenesis and cardiovascular disease. But I think it's worth noting that people always say, well, maybe there's an association with fatty liver and heart attacks. But it's not just heart attack. There's hypertensive heart disease, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction that leads to heart failure. And so in diastolic dysfunction, you make a stiff right ventricle, you overload that with fluid and and you, uh, you have heart failure as well. So there's a lot to the story when we begin to talk about the liver being central to overall health and a predictor of outcome. So yeah, I think canary in the coal mine is a very apropos statement to define what the liver does and is. Thank you, Stephen. That was, I think, a really good, succinct explanation of all the ways in which the liver chirps, if you will. Comments from anybody in terms of how this canary in the coal mine phenomenon affects you in the work that you do or in the things you observe about the liver? 
from the perspective of developing diagnostics, which is my day job, you know, certainly that underlying pathophysiology, which is not necessarily in your face and super apparent, that's both the challenge, but that's also the reward when you can discover something because it's really not something that's very easy to delineate. I think the biology of the liver is actually very sophisticated. Yes, it's a mega metabolic warehouse. There's so many things that it contributes to the body. But with that said, being able to tease apart some of these very specific pathways that may be modulated with NASH is, is, is very, very challenging. So when you find that, and when you find those processes and you find those biomarkers, or you find that elevated stiffness, it really tells you something uh, about the processes going on in the liver and, and the kind of more global health of that individual. Um, and we're, we're seeing some things that we can talk about at later on, like with regards to COVID that sort of exacerbate this or provide some, some context for this. But it's not something that you just immediately see or recognize. But when you do find it, it has significant meaning that should at least help put that person into a broader context. I think Stephen came from exactly where I come from by the end of it. It was like scan everybody or find everybody and then we can um, locate those other diseases. And when I think back to the episode we did for the global NASH event, I looked up the term of advocacy and it's all about pleading and pitching in for your patient portfolio or your condition. And I think, and it is sad that I describe much of liver related NAFLD NASH and all of the comorbid conditions that this is now associated with. Plus, when you add in hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which between them take up one in 12 of the global population, with hep C being the largest viral killer, I think if you also then add 240 million dependent drinkers that are estimated, the fact that we are having a conversation or still pleading for liver disease to be taken seriously and looked at by each of these specialities, the time for pleading is coming to an end. You actually have to recognise that this organ is a really significant part of your patient's pathway. And if we ignore it, then we're not doing our patients great service because we're avoiding one of the big parts of where that patient has travelled through their journey and we're missing it. Now, is that protectionism for your own disease? I don't know. But I remember distinctly sitting in a boardroom discussing how we could add things like liver testing to different specialities to be greeted with a cardiologist saying, well, if you cure cardiac disease, where, where's my job gone? And I think that's not about the patient. So this self-protectionism for our diseases and silo thinking, when you have an organ that really is a major contributor to a lot, and even dementia nowadays, metabolic dementia, Alzheimer's, there's growing links for that. I think we do have to take a step back and say, we've got to be collegiate. We've got to work together and we've got to really wake up and smell the coffee and get the liver round the table as one of the first diagnostics. Let's rule it out. Then we can move on to something else. The liver is a glorious organ. I decided in 1983 that I would pursue gastroenterology and hepatology as a subspecialty. And I did that because of the central nature of the liver to so many metabolic, synthetic, and detoxifying functions in, in the body. And by making the liver central to the pathophysiology of metabolic disease, as we're talking about, it's really a beautiful concept. I'm a drug developer, a scientist a physician. But in every meeting that I sit in with industry, there is a quiet person over in the corner who is a commercial person. They often don't say very much, but they do after the meeting. And when you don't get calls back from companies, it's often because the commercial person spoke up. In the context of commercial drug development, although we have a lot of positive things going for us, there's going to be some commercial focus in our drug development and comorbidities that we're going to have to focus on in order to really understand how NASH drugs, not lifestyle changes, but NASH drugs are going to affect this area. So for instance, and I'll have more to say about this later, but the commercial person is sitting there thinking about full approval perspective. They're also sitting there thinking about comorbidities and how do we 
treat those, weight change, or what effect the drugs might have on that, weight change, insulin resistance, lipids. They're thinking about trial design. What are payers going to want as part of the trial design and run in for clinical trials to try to determine what the real effect of your drug is versus any effect from diet exercise and other things? So I think that the liver is central, and because it's central, it's challenging to tease out the real effect from a commercial standpoint. What I'm saying doesn't negate anything that Stephen Sunil and and Louise have talked about because I violently agree with everything that they said, but I think it does have implications for the clinical development of commercially viable drugs. Thanks, Peter. I want to come at this from a different angle because I'm a forecaster with something of a statistics background. So Stephen mentioned the covariance of steatosis and fibrosis, and the fibrosis will always win out. First of all, when you apply statistics inappropriately, like trying to focus on too narrow an area, you miss the ability to capture the richness of multidimensional relationships, which is exactly what Stephen's talking about. Number two, a lot of times when two numbers co-vary, one might be a slightly better fit to a specific problem than the other one is, but the second one might do a better job of explaining the underlying phenomena. So if we've got things that are highly correlated, the rule that we teach in marketing statistics is use the one that makes the better sense in the overall context, which might not be the one that has the higher value for that particular exercise. And I think that's what you're talking about here. If you look at this specific problem, fibrosis might matter more. If you take a look at the broader context, steatosis might have greater value. Peter, I think that goes back to your point as well, which is it's hard enough to think in terms of complex univariate stats, let alone multidimensional things. That's why we talk about being so hard to play chess in three dimensions, let alone two. If you try to define things as being on one dimension or another, something like fat will not do a great job of doing that because it will have a role to play in so many different dimensions. So every time you look for a clean solution to a problem like saying, okay, how do I solve this dimension? That's not going to be the first thing that pops up. But the holistic value of that as the second player in can take you in lots of different directions and solve lots of things at once. It makes it extremely enticing. It makes it tough to describe commercially, but I think that's the challenge that we face. Peter, am I tracking you right? Yes. In the case for the liver being a central metabolic organ in the pathophysiology of multiple things makes it increasingly challenging to show from a clinical trial standpoint. That completely follows. So with that as a general background, I'd like to dive into one specific set of issues. Part of what I believe Brian was positing was that obesity matters more than liver does. That if you dealt with obesity, you wouldn't have to worry about NASH. Now, certainly the two are correlated. If you lose body weight, you can have an effect starting at effect on steatosis at 3%. But there is work in both COVID and cardiovascular disease that suggests that the simple idea that obesity matters more might not capture the dynamic very well. So Stephen, do me a favor, take a minute and talk about how that applies in cardiovascular disease, maybe in the context of diabetes as a separate comorbidity or otherwise, and then we'll go on and talk about the liver and a couple of other issues. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to tease out cause and effect and what comes first, the chicken or the egg and and all that. But if you posit that the main cause of mortality in patients with non-serotic NAFLD and NASH is heart disease, there's some interesting statistics that are coming out. The incidence of heart disease in fatty liver has been shown to correlate with the degree of fibrosis in the liver up to cirrhosis child's A with five points. So child Tricot Pew score A is either five points or six points, and then B is seven points, and then so on. But you can actually tease out child's A5 from A6. And we know that the incidence of heart disease in fatty liver has been documented to correlate all the way up to A5. And then the liver-related mortality increases in fatty liver only when patients progress to A5 to A6 and beyond. And again, just going back to what's been shown in literature, we know heart disease, or at least ischemia and atherosclerosis, what we classically call coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular accidents, CVAs, peripheral vascular disease are associated with fatty liver, but there's also relationships to left ventricular muscle remodeling, which leads to diastolic dysfunction and what we call HPEF or HEFPEF, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what we call HEFPEF, H-F-P-E-F. We also know already, as I mentioned, the degree of diastolic dysfunction and impairment of exercise tolerance is directly linked to fibrosis stage and pre-serotic NAFLD. 
We know NAFLD is linked to arrhythmias, QTC prolongation, AFib, even ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, and also to abnormal calcium deposition in the coronary arteries, as well as carotids and other large arteries, even valvular issues like mitral annular calcification, aortic sclerosis, and stenosis. So this notion that you just manage the obesity or manage the diabetes and and you'll take care of heart disease, I think is maybe a little myopic. There's more to the story than that for sure. And I, I think we're just beginning, again, to use Sunil's term, unpack all of this pathogenesis, it's not in a vacuum. You would think that if it was just all about weight loss that bariatric surgery patients, they lose 100 pounds that that they're going to live to be 300 years old. And that just doesn't happen. They still die of CV outcomes and other issues. They may have controlled their diabetes and lost weight and their blood pressure is under better control. And maybe they lost fat and maybe even NASH. But we're beginning to understand in a lot of ways that, that maybe weight loss doesn't have such a dramatic impact on fibrosis as we once thought it did. And I've tried to get at the bariatric surgery literature a bit here to understand it. The problem is that most people with advanced liver disease, either they're not studied in the setting of bariatric surgery or they're not included in bariatric surgery trials. There's very little data on cirrhotics that undergo bariatric surgery and what happens to them relative to their underlying liver disease. So it's a complex issue. I completely agree. I think it's a very, very complex topic, which for the sake of you know argument is sometimes simplified down to say obesity. But just like how we're talking about Nash and our perspective on Nash is, you know, there's there's a lot going on there. I mean, obesity, I mean, if you really want to go backwards, I mean, technically everyone in the NFL is obese. If you were to use simply a BMI scale, that would be true, which we know is not true. There are some of the most healthiest people on earth. But even from an obesity standpoint, when you talk about fat, you're talking about two major things going on and, and not all fats the same, not just in terms of quality and also storage. If you take excess caloric as an input, and then you say, well, where can I put it? Well, it can either go, for example, I'm, I'm keeping it very, very general, subcutaneous fat. You know, it's, it's trying to store it away. It's trying to store it away in, in a relatively safe place. Of course, the effect of doing that is you start to look big, as you should, because that's what's, what the body is trying to do, is trying to, is trying to store things and put things away. But the other place where it can go is it can go directly into your organs in the form of ectopic fat. That's far more pathogenic in nature. It can lead to insulin resistance. And this obviously drives many processes, including type 2 diabetes. So just in that sense, right, it's not really the same. And so the second case is far more severe. And maybe in those individuals, rapid weight loss confers some type of health benefit and improvement to organ function, including the liver and things of that nature. But at the same time, you can't generalize that to, to the entire population. And to the comment around cirrhosis, which is another fascinating area, which I think we're still learning more and more. We know that fat is not necessarily as important. I'm not saying it's not important, but the disease evolves. And so when you start to think about people who are late stage or even, you know, uh, well compensated cirrhotic, you know, the liver fat begins to disappear, yet the disease is still moving forward. Clearly, it was necessary to initiate the disease and take it to a certain place. But after that, the disease itself may take a a life of its own. And it could be very much inflammatory and fibrotic in nature, more so than metabolic. And, And so even in the natural history of disease, I think you start to see these multi-dimension, multi-parameter kind of elements evolve in their weights, which I think is fascinating. Okay, thanks. I'll make just a couple comments in, in, in two different areas. First of all, I'm not going to repeat the nice descriptions we've heard about pathophysiology in heart disease and so forth. I just wanted to mention that that pathophysiology is a combination of both changes in lipids and inflammation. And I think we haven't given full focus on the relationship between the intestine and the liver. And as many of you know, the omentum and the mesentery in the intestinal uh, tract contains a lot of fat. And it's inflammatory type fat that can build up there and cause additional problems with the liver. And I think that's something that may be involved in both NASH as well as cardiovascular disease. 
But beyond pathophysiology, I just want to make the comment about what we do to try to move clinical development forward in NASH. And I believe that there are three points I want to make. One, on comorbidities, two, on trial design, and then three, on a full approval perspective. From the standpoint of comorbidities, I think NASH drugs should have no effect on comorbidities from the standpoint of adverse effect, or it could have improvement in a benefit in the magnitude of the effect on comorbidities, and I think that would be the best. But adverse effects on those comorbidities are going to be viewed by commercial folks as very questionable. And so I think that's a really critical thing. So for instance, if a drug works well, but it causes weight gain, depending on what the weight gain is from, whether it's fat or whether it's fluid, that's going to be a problem, whereas weight loss is going to be a benefit. Insulin resistant, lipids. If your LDLC goes uh, up, it's going to be questioned. If it goes down, it's going to be a positive. So I think that clinical development needs to focus on these comorbid areas very clearly. Secondly, trial design. I think that commercial organizations and payers are going to look at the design of trials and say, well, what did you do in the run into the trial to ensure that you're seeing the effect on your drug? And I do think, hearkening back to what Brian uh, Harvey mentioned, is that we do need to counsel on diet and exercise, optimize dyslipidemia therapy, optimize diabetes therapy, and hypertension therapy. Because unless we do that, there's always going to be a question about what the effect of the drug is versus the other issues. And then finally, the full approval perspective. I know that that this is going to be controversial for some time, but trust me, commercial folks are going to be thinking about how can you get full approval for this drug. And if you only talk about surrogates, it's going to be a challenge to get engagement from commercial folks. So I think that all the things that we've talked about over the last four or five weeks kind of mean that we have to have at least a practical approach right now for the development of NASH drugs, which take all that into account. And if we design our trials that way, we can tease out some of these subsets as well as pathophysiological effects. Peter, I want to see if I understand you correctly. In the moment, if we have to go all the way to endpoints, that will cost a lot more money, a lot more time. A lot of the development's coming from small companies. When you talk about a practical approach, how does that factor in the reality of where drugs are getting developed in this market? Well, that's a good point, Roger. I think that when I talk about full approval, I'm really talking about pre serotic NASH and the progression to cirrhosis, which is still a histological endpoint, but it's an agreed clinical endpoint by the agencies at this point. That is an endpoint that could be reached in a, a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable number of patients if you have a drug that acts in a robust way. I think that that's going to be a challenging endpoint for something that has a, a 20% one-stage reduction in fibrosis in the group. You know, But as we've talked about before, a 40-50% one-stage reduction, you could conceive of getting to that decrease in progression to cirrhosis pretty quickly. And Roger, I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue to pursue the surrogate endpoints, because I'm 100% in agreement with Stephen that that is something that we should never take off the table and we could keep pushing. What I'm talking about is the commercial perspective right now is going to be focused on that. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when we think about drug development. I see where you're coming. I think we're going to keep circling back to that issue over and over and over again. I think it was raised once and kind of pops up again. And I think we're going to we're going to come back towards that in a bunch of different contexts. And yes, I do understand what you're saying. I think it does make sense. Louise, I know you've been posting online from time to time about different issues having to do with COVID. If you could uh, touch on that for a minute. I think the point that I've tried to make, and I think a lot of it requires more and more evidence, but I think I was very early in the timeline saying that these comorbid conditions are staring us in the face and are the early sort of evidence that came out was all about diabetes risk, cardiovascular risk, hypertension. But actually the elephant in the room was most of these conditions have something else in relation and that was the liver fat and the high liver fat. And I think more and more studies have started 
to now be looking at that. More and more time has been taken to look at MRI scans on some of the patients that were done at that time. You didn't get the opportunities to do some of the tests that we would have liked to have done. And I think retrospectively, we can go back and collect some of that data. But I think one of the key ones that obviously we're aware hasn't been peer reviewed yet was the UK Biobank and Prospectum study, which came out of Oxford University. And I think coming to what Stephen, Peter and Sunil have been talking about is that wasn't so much that the obese population had the highest risk because 37.2% of obese patients where they had normal liver fat were seen to be at no higher risk of COVID. And I think we do need to look at where we're storing fat. And obesity has multiple reasons for being overweight. A lot of this could be down to advertising techniques. Most countries don't have a national strategy for liver, let alone a national strategy for fatty liver. And a lot of that is down to lobbying by alcohol and food manufacturers. Also, it's not within a government's interests in a lot of areas because a lot of tax comes off these areas. So where they're harboring and promoting in one respect We're dealing with the downstream costs and the biggest downstream cost we could now find out could be in our country 300 billion to a disease that we've developed and created with over 25% of our population being obese, but not 25% of our population have nettled. And I think looking earlier downstream and interesting listening to the conversation the guys were having is that we're talking about some all conditions after the horse has bolted because they've been developed. By going further to the underlying cause in a lot of these, which is NAFLD and NASH, if you can detect the point that somebody's liver becomes fatty, and the definition for the UK Biobank study was just 10% was counted as severe fatty liver. If we can find the time that that liver becomes more fatty, then we've probably got the timeline start for cardiovascular disease, for type 2 diabetes. There was a very interesting study done out of Sweden last year in in December, just before COVID came down. And it was done on the amount of fat in the liver predicts mortality and the development of type 2 diabetes in NAFL patients. And what they'd done is one of the first studies that I've ever seen. They took 106 patients with no diabetes at baseline, followed them at 13 years and 23 years and biopsied at all three time points. And... In the patients where the fat was measured, where it went up, they developed type 2 diabetes. However, where it came down, they did not develop type 2 diabetes. So they themselves asked the question whether or not type 2 diabetes could be avoided, as you suggested earlier, if we actually prevent the liver fat starting in the first place. This becomes not so much primary care and failures with primary care. This becomes health education in schools. This becomes monitoring of health in schools. They'll get a test. They get their jabs in this country at certain ages. Childhood diabetes diabetes and obesity is escalating. 10% of all 10-year-olds who are morbidly obese have cardiac symptoms. So this becomes, where are we going to monitor this? Can we put it into a timeline for schools and find it? Okay, Stephen, you were going to come back to something Peter had commented on? Just some pragmatic observations about looking at progression to a hard endpoint. It's easy to do that, right, to say that. I mean, progression to cirrhosis is clearly an endpoint that is associated with a negative hepatic outcome. But we also know that if you delay progression to cirrhosis, that that is also, you know, applicable in, in a lot of ways. So just kind of working through as a thought experiment, what Peter was saying, if you analyzed your data through an interim analysis and you showed maybe through artificial intelligence using fully quantitative assessment of collagen that you had less progression of disease, but you didn't reach a clear number that said we had 300 patients progress to cirrhosis in the placebo group and we had we had 100 in the drug group, so therefore we reached a pre-specified endpoint and we should get approval. If you showed that you were marching towards that with some very validated markers, then I think that would be one way to get accelerated approval 
even though you didn't hit the number? Because I think it takes time, right? And, you know, the, the alternative is you have to enroll a large number of patients, like a huge number of patients, more than what we typically enroll in a phase three NASH trial. And they need to be F3s, not F2s. Or we need to figure out what the rapid fibrosis progressors are and only enroll those guys. Because ultimately, that's going to get us to a progression to cirrhosis endpoint quicker. I think at our, the way the paradigm currently is, if we enroll F2s and F3s, the F2s are going to have a much harder time, even in the placebo group, getting to cirrhosis in any time period less than 10 years. If you look at Rohit's work, it's about one stage every seven years to progression. So if we're going from an F2 to F4, that's 14 years on average. So I think that would kill drug development if we had to do that. But I think getting at something short of that by showing that we've reduced the rate of fibrosis progression. And AI is going to look at this from a percentage basis, right? 30%, 20% rate of halting progression of disease would be interesting to consider. But at the end of the day, I'm still a believer in accelerated approval. I just think maybe we need to make it easier for the endpoint to be defined. And I think we wouldn't be having this discussion really if there weren't issues with the way the pathologists are interpreting the data. If we had a very clear agreement across the board with high kappa statistics, we wouldn't be having this discussion, really. I think it would be a moot point. So making a surrogate endpoint easier to define, clearly having it linked to an outcome, I still think we can use accelerated approval to get these drugs to market, particularly some of the new drugs coming that have a potential major impact on CV outcomes as well. To a certain extent, Stephen, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I am completely invested in what you just said and the desirability of having an interim endpoint that's going to give you confidence about whether you can hit the hard endpoint of progression to cirrhosis. And I think that that may be doable. I think the real question is whether the FDA or the EMA is going to approve a drug based on that kind of an interim endpoint. You will agree, I think, with me that if a drug has 50% of the patients respond with at least a one-stage reduction in fibrosis and 25% respond with a two-stage reduction in fibrosis in F3 patients and advanced F2 patients, that that drug has a much better chance of hitting the endpoint of progression to cirrhosis than some of the drugs that we've seen so far. I think that's kind of what people are going to be looking at, a drug that has enough robust activity to be able to hit that endpoint of decreased progression to cirrhosis. So I'm just playing a little bit devil's advocate about what our expectations might have to be to get a drug approved. One of the nice things about drama series is that they always have cliffhangers at the end, so there's always something to come back to in the next episode. Let's leave this topic in that category. And I also want to revisit the three-way di- relationship between type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and fatty liver when we come back to this, which I'm sure we will next week or the week after. For now, I want to remind the audience we're looking for guidance on exactly how to shape patient segmenting. And any other questions you've got on this, email questions at surfingnash.com or go to the webpage. I think this has been a great discussion. It's been everything. I hoped it would be maybe a little bit more, actually. Let's just go back around one more time. Something you heard today that surprised you. I think what surprises me, or at least an observation from our discussion today is we're talking on two ends of a spectrum. One, a very important public health poll of what we do with fatty liver and early disease and society, how we identify the disease and so forth. And on the other hand, how we develop a drug for more advanced disease with fibrosis. Those two poles are challenging to bring together And I think that's one of the things that we're struggling with and trying to do. I think it's a struggle we should continue to explore because that's where some unique thinking might come forward. So just to follow on what Peter was saying, I don't think that developing a drug for fatty liver 
has to just be about a liver endpoint. And maybe this is just not necessarily something that surprised me, but it's something that gained a little more clarity from the conversation. And getting at drugs that can modulate the liver, but also impact CV outcome, for instance, is something that I think warrants a discussion, warrants a clear line of understanding and guidance by the regulatory authorities on how this can be done. I think it can be done relatively easily. And there are drugs that are going to mainly go after the liver-related endpoint of trying to reverse the scar tissue and the fibrosis, either through hitting the drivers of fibrosis or hitting fibrosis directly. Or they're going to go after you know some of these extra hepatic endpoints at the same time. Maybe they're not the greatest drug for fibrosis improvement, but they're working on some of the drivers of NASH that actually may have more of an impact on CV outcomes. To your point, I think that's worthy of a discussion on a different podcast. I think my surprise today was how we all agreed that in the future we would really like non-invasive technologies all to be the sort of cornerstone of where we're heading because it's advantageous to everybody. But once we're there and once we've got accurate ways to pick up the liver. Usually not a direction I go in, but I guess the one thing I'm surprised is that while we all agree that AI-based systems are going to have the potential to be very transformative and and we may be there from a technology standpoint, we haven't discussed yet sort of the the other side of it, which is sort of the the business model side of that endeavor, because clearly data is paramount. Data has a significant value and and a challenge in healthcare in general has been sharing of that data. So how do we realize it in practice? Because I think there, there, there are some nuances is there that may get in the way of that coming to fruition sooner than later. It might be fun at some point to get a couple of people who can comment specifically on AI to come on and talk about what could we do with better data techniques. AI and maybe some of the other and machine learning or something that's go along with that. Because I think what surprised me today was more realization than anything else, which is that if you work out from the liver, you go in a lot of different directions. That in a logical world, the way the market would go is that we would find ourselves to uh, expedite, uh, to accelerate the approval, get a couple of drugs on the market, and then start to see what actually happens. Because if we have to posit complex pathways using second and third level data that don't have the clearest relationships. And we've got to do all that before we have therapies. I have a hard time figuring out how we're going to solve the problem, therefore how we're going to prove the case. So either we're going to solve it by getting drugs in some kind of accelerator approval setting, or by having such good machine learning and AI that we can start a model out at a level of complexity that I can't see my way to yet. But my surprise is to think that that might be an answer, really. I think we're good for today. I want to thank all the surfers for coming on. I want to remind you to send us questions and comments about what we're doing. I want to thank our engineer podcaster for making us sound good. Social media master Eric Rounds, Ellen Charip, who's come on board as an editor and content manager. And next, for special thanks to you, our subscribers and our listeners, some of whom we know and a lot of whom we find out about every week, who've made this a honest-to-goodness, fast-growing place where people look for information about fatty liver disease. We will be back on July 23rd, Thursday, with episode 15. We're working on a couple things that might be real juicy at that time. If not, maybe we'll just pick up this conversation where we left it and keep going through these kinds of issues, because I think they're fascinating. And at least the panelists agree as well. Love to hear from the listeners. Until then, stay safe, surf on. Uh, Thanks, everybody. See you next week. You've been listening to Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Send in your questions to surfingnash.com and our panelists will spend the first five minutes of next week's episode answering your questions. Visit us online today, surfingnash.com.